sig and I want to if uh, is Frank online here? Um, yes, I'm here. Uh, perfect, perfect. And are you able to share your screen or not uh, yet? Okay, so let me give so you you have to ability. Yes. Ah, so you can do that now. Yes. So slides should be here now. Yes. And uh, okay, and uh, shall we begin the recording? I think oh, it is already, already recording. Good. Yes. So okay, good. So thank you. Um, so yeah. So here now, uh, I guess it's the final talk of the day. Is Frank Saresig, uh, who is going to. Uh, tell us about the black holes beyond general relativity. So thank you very much. Yes. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk here and also for accommodating me at the last talk of the day. So that was really helpful for me to fit it into the schedule. So what I'm going to talk about is a recent work that I finished with work, two of my PhD students, so yes, it does, and Cristobal Laporte. And if you want to more, more about the technical details, you should contact them. So I'm only the messenger boson. Since I understand that this is a workshop organized by students who are quite curious, uh, I'm very happy to take questions also during the talk. So please feel to in, uh, free to interrupt at any time. So this brings me to the outline. So first, talking to Antonio Pereira, he said it's okay to share some personal anecdotes. So I added this into the beginning because it also marked my, the beginning of my research career. And then I will continue the journey going towards black holes. So essentially there are two main parts of the talks. There are black holes from the viewpoint of a quantum theory, which I want to discuss. And I want to have a section on regular black holes. And then I will close with a brief outlook. So what I found amazing about the topic of the workshop is actually if you consider any work that proposes a new type of black hole solutions, essentially it always has a chapter addressing black hole thermodynamics. So whatever you do, you cannot go around this topic. And in terms of importance, I think there's not much better evidence that you can provide, except for this particular fact of, that you opened up a new research direction. Now, in terms of the authors of this paper, I happened to be lucky. So I was educated by the first one, so uh, Jim Bardeen. So this goes back, well, almost 25 years when I actually started to learn general relativity. And I learned this from Bardeen in about one year. And this GR course, this was really legendary. So we had 20 lectures. And in these 20 lectures, we went through the book by Mr. Torn and Wheeler from beginning to the end. So essentially, he was bold enough to give us reading assignments of about 80 pages per week. So in the end, you probably didn't understand every detail, but you have a great overview about general relativity. Then he was also responsible of my first encounter with quantum gravity. So in the second semester, we were asked to write a term paper and I had the crazy idea, I wanted to write something about quantum gravity. And approaching the teacher, if this is actually feasible, he said, yes, of course, write something about the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. So that was my first encounter with quantum gravity and it was actually a lot of fun. And I should also mention that I happened to go uh, know that Bartin also was phenomenal in terms of hiking. So he guided our study group through a tour 
to Mount Rainier in the uh, close to Seattle. And this was actually quite an amazing trip. And the stamina that he showed on this trip, so this I found very, really impressive. Now, in terms of recollections, at the basis of my research career, then let's go to the topic of the talk, black holes. So recently they have really moved into the research focus. And I think there are two specific items that really created a lot of attention for black holes. So the first one is that black hole binaries serve as a powerful source for gravitational wave in, uh, signals. So we can really fit, uh, detect the signal that we have here. And what we observe is in very good agreement with the predictions of general relativity. Then there's a second line of research that is related to actually taking images of black holes. So this is shadow observations done by the Event Horizon Telescope. And the trick is actually that you can take pictures which show a black hole at the resolution, which is more than one pixel. Then you see that there is a region where we see a brightness depletion. This is the black hole shadow. And then we have a bright region surrounding this shadow. And also the predictions of this ring are in very good agreement with general relativity. So that brings black holes into the range where we can actually do observations with them. And it also moved them beyond the scientific realm. So also the general public got very much fascinated by these pictures so that we have a couple of exhibits here in the Netherlands now bringing the black hole physics to the attention of everybody that is interested in science. So I mentioned, so the results that we have seen on the last two slides, they are in perfect agreement with general relativity. And then working in a department where we have a strong gravity group and a quantum gravity group, essentially this gives two viewpoints on this result. I put them very pointedly here. So if I talk to a general relativist or our mathematical physics group, then they essentially say, okay, why do we need to test this theory experimentally? It's so beautiful, it must be correct. While on the other hand, if you talk about, uh, to a quantum physicist, then he would exactly turn the statement around. So why do we need to understand every last detail of the theory? We know that if quantum physics kicks in, it must be incorrect. And it's the second viewpoint that I will follow up in this talk and try to investigate a little bit about what quantum physics could do with the black hole solutions of general relativity. So when we go to general relativity, a black hole is a very simple object. So it's a vacuum solution of Einstein's equations. It has an outside region where space becomes asymptotically flat. If we move to the inside, we will encounter an event horizon that sits here. And within this event horizon, we have a sing singularity. And essentially, if we impose proper symmetries, like spherical symmetries, there's also uniqueness theorem saying that all the black holes that obey this symmetry are determined by actually one parameter. So that can be seen as follows. So we can start from a spherical symmetric static line element. What I've written here is the most general form that this line element can take in Schwarzschild coordinates. So we have two metric coordinates. I denoted them by H and F here. 
And if we plug this line element in the equations of motion of general relativity, then we are told first that the metric functions are degenerate and they take a simple form. They are given by one minus two M over R. And throughout the talk, I will work in Planck units. So G is set equal to one. Then down here, I'm plotting the metric functions. So R bar is my radial coordinate here. The two things fall on top of each other. I pick the mass equal to 10. So the horizon is at 20. We have an outside region where asymptotically we become asymptotically flat. And there's an inside region where we move towards the singularity. We can actually characterize the singularity, for example, by computing the Kretschmann scalar. So there's a characteristic one over R to the sixth singularity that we have here. And of course, since our black holes have a horizon, we can also associate a Hawking temperature with the horizon. So this is inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. Now we are interested in going beyond this picture and ask about quantum corrections. So we can take a very conservative approach. So we can start from the Einstein-Hilbert action. This is written here, G is Newton's constant, R is the Ricci scalar. And we can start to quantize the theory perturbatively. Then we can compute the one loop corrections to this action. And we find that there are two different types of contributions. First, there are singularities that appear in this quantization procedure. And these have to be canceled by local counterterms. So there, these counterterms at one loop has the structure that they are proportional to the curvature of space time squared. So in principle, we can write down three of them. So we have an R squared, we have the square of the Ricci tensor, and we have the integrand of the Gauss-Bonnet identity. So the E will give us a topological contribution. So this will not really matter. Now, if we look at the first two terms, we see the following property. So if we compute the equations of motion based on these two terms, they will be proportional to the Ricci tensor. That means if we impose the vacuum equations of general relativity, these contributions will vanish automatically. So this is the statement that we can absorb these counter terms in a field redefinition so that when we quantize the Einstein-Hilbert action at one loop level, the result is one loop finite. Now, there are also some non-local terms coming up in this quantization procedure. So here the delta is essentially the D'Alembertian of the theory. It's sandwiched between two curvature quantities and the fact that this operator appears in the form of a logarithm tells us it's a non-local piece. Now, these non-localities are notoriously difficult to deal with. Uh, let's not go this direction and see what else can we do in terms of local correction terms. So then we can move one step further. We can go to a two-loop quantization procedure. And then we encounter a genuine counter term when in the quantization. So this is the counter term found by Gorov and Sagnotti. It is proportional to the wild tensor cubed. So that means it's a term that contains six space-time derivatives. And I introduced a coupling constant lambda for this new term. The important thing is that if we include this term in the dynamics, then 
we will get a non-trivial contribution to the equations of motion, which is not vanishing on the vacuum Einstein equation. So this makes this term a genuine counter term in the construction. Now we could ask, what does this correction term do if we look for spherical symmetric and static solutions? So what would be a good strategy to actually answer this question? Well, we can compute the equations of motion. You apply the variational principle to the combination of the Einstein-Hilbert term plus the counter term, you get something. Then you substitute the line element that we had in Schwarzschild coordinates. And as a result, you obtain a differential equation for your two metric functions, h and s. And in the next step, you try to solve the system. OK, the result of that can be simply summarized as follows. It's a very difficult procedure. And apart from a local analysis based on the system, little is known about the effect. So in order to actually progress on this question, what does Gorf Zagnotti does to a Schwarzschild geometry, we have to find a trick. And the trick is as follows. So instead of working with Schwarzschild coordinate, we appoint a new coordinate system. So this is a clever change of coordinates that was essentially proposed in the context of quadratic gravity by the group of Podolsky and co-workers. And instead of working with F and H, the information about the metric is contained in a conformal factor. So this is the omega squared that we have here. And a second free function, this is the H here. So from the spherical part of this line element, you can read off that the radial coordinate and Schwarzschild coordinate is now mapped to this conformal factor here. And you can also write the explicit relation between the functions omega and h that we have here and the small h and f that appear in Schwarzschild coordinates. And then if you evaluate the equations of motion on this line element, something really amazing happens. Your equation of motion fit on one slide. So this is shown actually here. And the fact that you can write them in one line actually shows that you have done something very good in terms of simplifying the system. So this is significantly simpler than the equations of motion that we have in H and F. And more important, our mathematician friends like this property, the system is autonomous. So it only contains the function H and omega and no explicit R dependence. So this is also quite useful in the analysis. You also observe that the degree of this differential equations is actually set by the Gorov and Sandiotti term. So here in these equations, I solved for the corresponding highest derivatives, which is the third derivatives of H and the second derivative of omega. And you see, if you bring this denominator to the left-hand side, then the highest derivative is proportional to the Gorov and Sagnotti coupling lambda that sits down here. This has the effect that if you send the new coupling to zero, then the degree of your equations of motion will actually change. As a consequence, this might entail that not all solutions that you have in this system actually continuously connect to the Schwarzschild solution if you switch off the correction terms. Okay, so here we really made progress in order to make the system accessible to analysis. On this basis, 
we can derive a series of results. So the first thing that one might be interested in are corrections in the asymptotically flat region. And here, it's convenient to write the result in terms of the metric functions that we know from the Schwarzschild case, so H and S. So you start with flat space. This is the one sitting in here. The green terms are the ones that you have from general relativity. And the red ones are corrections. So you see the corrections are proportional to the mu coupling constant. So this is due to the modifications in the equations of motion. It's also very characteristic that these corrections only appear at sub-subleading order. So the first correction term is at 1 over r to the 6. You can translate this in terms of the post-parametrized post-Newtonian expansion. So the correction that is sitting here is at 6th six, order in the PPN. It's also important that these new terms from the perspective of GR, they are forbidden by Birksoff's theorem. But since our vacuum equations of motion are different in this theory, we are allowed to actually have these terms. The second amazing property is that we still have a kind of no hair theorem. So we have one free parameter, the mass, that determines the asymptotic mass of the solution. And we have one additional new parameter. This is the coupling lambda. But this is all the parameters that completely describe this solution. And well, here I only wrote the leading corrections, the subleading corrections. But based on the conformal to count formalism, we can go way beyond and essentially get the first 25 coefficients in the series. And on this basis, we find that there are no free parameters also at higher orders. So the system in terms of free parameters is strikingly simple. What we also observe is that the property that H is equal to F is lost as soon as these correction terms are included. So this is an accidental property that we observe based on Einstein's equations. And once the correction terms are included, they no longer hold. Based on having the higher order parameters in the series, we also concluded that the series comes with a finite radius of convergence. So in fact, comparing to numerics shows that this is a very good approximation to the exterior of our black hole. Now taking this analytic result, we can actually integrate the equations of motion that we have numerically. In principle, we can use this expansion at the asymptotically flat region as a starting point for numerical integration that ensures that we are dealing with an asymptotically flat solution. And having the conformal to Kant system actually allows you to succeed in the numerical integration. So we could continue a solution from the asymptotically flat region down to the horizon. And in terms of solutions, since F and H are no longer degenerate, it's amaz an amazing property by itself that the deformed solution still has a horizon. So if you look here at the right-hand side, so there is the deviation between the numerical solution and the Schwarzschild solution, we see that H and F deviate differently, but there is one point where the two functions again agree and this sets the horizon of our deformed solution. So horizons persist. I should also mention that in terms of numerical integration, we only got half of the solution space to work. So 
This picture that I have here with a well-defined extended solution only appears if we take the coupling constant lambda to be positive. So for negative values, we were not able to reconcile the asymptotic expansion with the numerical integration that we have here. Also, if we choose the parameters appropriately, then we see that the numerical integration closely follows Schwarzschild, and you really have to zoom into the difference to discuss, uh, to detect the difference in terms of the metric functions. Now, since we have a horizon established, we can actually compute the Hawking temperature. This is given by the surface gravity at the horizon. And we focus on the region where we have a positive coupling constant. Now, keeping the mass of our solution fixed, m is equal to 10, and changing the parameter lambda, then we see that a positive lambda first reduces the area of the event horizon, but it also increases the temperature of the horizon. And comparing what you get in terms of the analytic expansion and numerical integration, you see you can easily verify on this plot that the analytic approximation of the solution gives you essentially the same result as the numerical integration. However, the numerical integration is a little bit noisy. But the two lines definitely fall on top of each other. Now we can also ask, is this possible to actually get an idea on bounds on this parameter lambda? And what we opted for is to check the effect of the correction terms in terms of shadow imaging. So we used the first observation of the Event Horizon Telescope. So that builds on M87. And here, the angle of the shadow in the sky is measured to about 10% accuracy. Now, if you go through the theory, what determines the angle of the shadow in the sky, then you see that this is actually sensitive to the metric function h. So in principle, there is a specific point this is called the photon orbit, where a photon can actually circle the black hole. So this is an unstable orbit, but this is the physical feature that is actually responsible for the bright region that we see here in the picture. And then you can convert this to the coordinate radius of the shadow. There's a correction factor that takes into account the bending of light by the black hole. And based on this factor, you can then compute the angle in the sky. Now we can ask, OK, let's be within 10% of the measured value. What freedom do we have in terms of choosing lambda? And then you find that the lambda itself needs to be smaller than 10 to the 190. So in principle, why don't you get better bounds on this? The reason is if you express the mass of M87 in terms of Planck units, you have something that is of the order 10 to the 50. And in principle, this also sets the scale of these bounds that we have here. Probably you can do much better but in terms of getting a first expression, impression of what can be done in terms of these new parameters, it gives you an order of magnitude estimate. Now, we can also have a local analysis of our system close to the core. And there it turns out that the analysis is actually very complicated. So this is due to the high nonlinearity of the equations of motion, even 
in the conformal of, uh, to Kant system. However, for all families of solutions that obey a polynomial behavior, we found that all curvature scalars that appear in this expansion are either finite or vanishing. So that ties in nicely with an old result by Bob Holdem, who argued that once you have a sixth derivative term in your gravitational theories, that should be sufficient to expel curvature singularities from your system. So in principle, what we have in terms of local analysis at the core would fit into this picture with the caveat that we are not sure that our solutions that we have here actually connect to the asymptotic analysis that we have within the core. So extending the numerics below the horizon is definitely something that still needs to be done to understand the global picture properly. Okay, I think this is a good part to take questions if there are any about this topic. Yeah, yes. please go ahead. You're muted, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for the nice talk so, talk so far. Uh, just a question on the initial setup, since you um, discussed uh, second loop corrections and then said you have this uh, uh, Sagnotti term, term uh, yes. and and that's your initial setup uh, start. Yes. Uh, I I vaguely recall uh, that gravity is not uh, not perturbatively renormalizable to second loop order. So I have, it appears now that this makes a fine theory still what you do. Uh, is it because of this non-local terms or what, what is exactly, uh, so how does it connect to this uh, statement? No, um, so in principle, what we have here in terms of local corrections are precisely the terms that you need to add to the theory to absorb the divergencies that appear in the quantization of GR. Uh, so, so maybe uh, is it that the statement is at free loop order? You cannot renormalize with finitely many counter terms anymore, or, or so? No. Um, at the statement is at each loop order, you will get new counter terms. So at one loop, uh, basically you are lucky because all the counter terms that you encounter don't enter your equations of motion. This picture changes if you go to two loops and you have, then you have to add one counter term. This is the two loop counter term that I wrote here. So this is really needed to absorb the infinities from the quantization procedure. But then you are expected that at three loops, four loops, five loops, you get more counter terms that you need to add to the business. And it's just that this one is the one with the lowest number of space-time derivatives that you need to add. OK, uh, I've, I think, uh, so yeah, I, I will postpone further discussion on this. Uh... Okay. So this is not the main point, I think. But the important thing is you have to go to many more loops to encounter the problem with infinitely many counter terms. Okay, then I have probably misremembered that. Sorry. Thanks. Are there more questions? I don't see any uh, any more questions right now. Okay, then let me go to the second part, namely stability of regular black holes. So besides uh, be going into thermodynamics, uh, Badin also worked uh, had an ancient paper about expelling 
singularities from the Schwarzschild metric. And in principle, the basic recipe that underlies this research direction is the following. So you take the Schwarzschild metric, then you cut out the singularity, you replace it by a Desita core, and then you get a black hole that is actually regular in the sense that its curvature is bounded. So in this way, you find a static space-time that is free from singularities. And then this picture appears in various ways in the literature. So the Bardeen black hole was in the late 70s. There's the Hayward black hole. The picture was derived from asymptotic safety via RG improvements. Loop quantum gravity has the same recipe in form of Planck stars. So it's really a common theme. The question that is related to this setup is once we go beyond the static space time and introduce perturbations, does this bring back the singularities that we have expelled in our construction? Now, why could you suspect that this is the case? For that, let me first go a little bit more detailed in terms of the regular geometries. So we can have back our static spherically symmetric line element. This is given here. The metric functions are degenerate for Schwarzschild. But what we do is we promote the mass that we have here as a function of R. So then we describe the geometry in terms of something that is called the Misner sharp mass. If we want to have the Schwarzschild geometry, we would set this mass function to a constant, and we are back to the geometries that we know from general relativity. We can also use this formalism to accommodate charged black holes. So then we have a mass function that actually depends on R, and this R dependence is related to the charge of our black hole. So we see that for Q, equals zero, that reduces to the Schwarzschild case, and Q extends the solution to a charged black hole. And also, the regular Hayward geometry naturally falls into this class. So there's a specific form of the mass function, which depends on R and a new free parameter L and the asymptotic mass M. Now we can have a look at what these line elements actually do in terms of horizons. Essentially, the picture is the following. So we have an asymptotically flat region where our metric functions need to be positive and go to one. Then close to the core, we are supposed to be desita like That means the metric functions have to be positive. Then we also want to have an outer event horizon. That means we have a zero. And if we want to connect to something that is positive here, we need to have a second zero. That means all our regular geometries will have to have come with at least two horizons. There's an event horizon and also a Cauchy horizon. And this is essentially a universal feature of the construction. Also, this is the horizon structure that we have for the Nareisen and Nordström and the Kerr black holes. Good, this we understood. Now we can also take the line element and we can plot the curvature scalars like the Kretschmann scalar and we see no matter how we pick the mass, these quantities actually stay bounded. So this is the basic idea of having the regular black holes. So their curvature is actually limited. That makes them quite different from the Schwarzschild geometry that we had in the start with, where this K diverged as we sent R to zero. Now, 
where is the suspicion against regular black holes coming from? So we argued the regular black holes have a Cauchy horizon. That means it has the same horizon structure as the Reisner Nordstrom geometry. Now, if we put a perturbation in terms of the Reisner Nordstrom geometry, then these perturbations can move in and approach the Cauchy horizon. At this point, the perturbation experiences an infinite blue shift and the horizon itself becomes unstable. So this is what in the literature goes by the name of mass inflation instability. So we are dealing with an unstable horizon. Now we would like to understand if regular black holes have the same instability. So what do we do? We take a perturbation, we put it on the regular geometry, and importantly, we follow exactly the computation that is done in the Nord Reisner Nordstrom analysis. So this is a cartoon picture of my space-time geometry. I have a collapsing star that goes to here. The collapse forms an event horizon. It forms a Cauchy horizon. I have perturbations that are emitted by the star fall into the Cauchy horizon. And I have perturbations that are reflected at the outer potential and also go into the interior of the black hole. So important for the model is that we have a cross stream between ingoing and outgoing flows of matter in the system. Now, a way to analytically analyze what is done or what is happening close to the Cauchy horizon is then provided by the dynamical setup called the Ori model. So this gives an idealized description of the dynamics of the perturbations that we have in terms of these black hole geometries. So basically, the model consists of two shells. One is outgoing, one is ingoing on the Cauchy horizon. And at some point, these two shells cross. One is still ingoing and the other one is still outgoing. The Ori model simplifies this by being able to integrate out the effect of the outgoing shell so that the mo model traces the ingoing shell only. Then it sets up the dynamics for this shell and checks what it happens if it approaches the Cauchy horizon. So dynamically, we have an event horizon, we have a Cauchy horizon, we have the shell modeling the perturbation between the two. This shell separates space-time into two regions. So M minus is outside of the shell, M plus is inside of the shell, and the shell moves to the left, hitting on the Cauchy horizon. The dynamics of the system consists of two functions that we need to determine. So R gives us the position of the shell depending on time V. And we want to have the mass function in the region M plus in the interior. Then we also have boundary conditions that describe how the shell or how the mass function of the geometry happens here at the M minus. So this is traditionally taken as a fixed mass minus a small perturbation, which dies off as a power law behavior. Now, first step, we can analyze what happens with the dynamics of the shell. So we compute R of V, and no matter where we start the shell, as long as we start between the event horizon and the Cauchy horizon, the shell will always impact on the Cauchy horizon. So this is shown here by the series of blue curves. And this is the same, no matter if we do the Reisner Nordstrom analysis or whether we place the perturbation in a black hole, a uh, regular black hole space time. So this works universally. 
Now we can see what happens with the mass function in the interior of the shell. And we can first do it by analyzing the Reisner Nordstrom analysis. But then we find that by checking the dynamics, integrating the function, the mass function grows exponentially. This is shown here in the plot. So first we have a regime where not really anything is happening, but then suddenly we get close to the Cauchy horizon and M plus grows exponentially. We can translate this to the curvature and then the curvature also grows exponentially. And this is the instability of the Cauchy horizon for the Reisner Nordstrom case. On this basis, we could suspect that regular black holes have the same instability. So despite having expelled the singularity at the beginning, it might hit us back dynamically once perturbations are accounted for. Now we can actually take our favorite regular black hole space time and check whether this is actually the case. So we can solve the same dynamical system, but with a different geometry. And then it turns out that the curvature no longer blows up exponentially. It only increases by a power law. So in this sense, the singularity that builds up dynamical changes its character. So from really being a strong singularity, it now moves to a case where we only have a weak or a, in the classification of singularities, a wimper singularity. So on this basis, we conclude regular black holes work quite differently in terms of these instabilities than the reisner nordstrom case. Can we understand where this comes from? Yes, we can find the difference in the structure for the metric function in the interior region. So for the reisner nordstrom black hole, the corresponding dynamics is governed by a function that is linear in M+. Plus. For the regular black holes, there are classes where this is actually quadratic. And the fact that this function is quadratic introduces a novel attractor for M+. Plus. So essentially, the differential equation is no longer exponentially growing, but there are certain lines in M+, plus which cannot be crossed by the dynamics. And it is precisely this feature that makes the two geometries quite different in terms of the dynamics. Now this understood, we can also check what happens if we go one step further and go beyond the static background geometry and look for evaporating black holes. So we want to have Hawking flux included. So we have the temperature of the black hole. The orange line is the Schwarzschild singularities. Regular black holes, temperature is bounded and they move towards a cold remnant. So essentially here's the mass loss formula. Uh, Schwarzschild black hole evaporates completely. The regular black holes will have an asymptotically finite mass. Now, how does this affect our boundary conditions for the mass in the exterior region? So if we have a metric perturbation, this dies off with a power law, 1 over b, with a very high power. However, if you compute the boundary conditions, including Harkin flux, then you see there's a new term with a different power law coming in, in terms of the mass function. So instead of falling off with a power 1 over p to the 11th, it only falls off as 1 over b. This scaling is universal as long as you have a black hole with two horizons. It also tells you that for large values of v, it's not the metric perturbation that is dominant, it's the Hawking flux contribution 
that sets the boundary condition. So metric perturbations are long dead before the black hole actually reaches its final state. Now we can again look at the dynamics of our perturbation. The first phase we already know from the static analysis, the shell rapidly moves towards the Cauchy horizon, no matter where we start. But then it trails the position of the Cauchy horizon until it reaches its final critical point. And this dynamics is again universal for all geometries. What does it do in terms of curvature scalars? And the effect is actually dramatic. So we can go back to the Reisner and Nordstrom black hole. There we see that the Kretschmann scalar no longer grows exponentially. That happens at the beginning, but at asymptotically late times, it just remains constant. So our, there's no space-time singularity building up anymore and curvature remains bounded. For classes of black holes of the Hayward type, we still have a polynomial increase, but also this is far less dramatic than the exponential growth that we had in the initial system. So based on this analysis, we would conclude that the Harking effect is actually critical for the stability of the system we can group our black holes in essentially two classes. There's the Reisner Nordstrom class, the Bardeen class. The other class is Hayward and RG improved. And in the first class, our curvature remains finite and no dynamical singularity builds up. In the class two, we get a power law divergence of K. And we can track this to specific features of the mass functions that actually underlie these geometries. So then I should also add that there has been a debate about these effects in the literature. So there is a group arguing for tamed mass inflation. There's a group arguing about untamed mass inflation. I think I have been reasonably complete in terms of surveying the literature on this. But in the end, whenever you read papers from this series, this is the plot that you should keep in mind. So the mass function M plus sets the curvature of space-time. And in principle, there are three regimes that you can distinguish. A regime where nothing exciting happens, an intermediate time regime where the mass function grows exponentially, and then you hit the late time attractors where M plus starts stops growing exponentially and moves over to power law behavior. So I think this summarizes pretty much the status quo that has been distilled from the arguments going on in the literature. Now, let me move to conclusions. So we had essentially two discussions in this talk. So, First, we were thinking about quantum corrections to the Schwarzschild geometry. We were looking for additions to the equations of motion that would remove the Schwarzschild solution from the solution space. And the simplest way to do this is the Gorov and Zanotti counter term. This induces characteristic corrections to the geometry, which appear in the post Newtonian expansion at sixth order. And we have a rather simple description in this exterior region. Now, this is the start point, and I think it invites a lot of future work. So in principle, one can ask a pure phenomenology question. So what are experiments probing the gravitational force that are sensitive to corrections that work differently on the two metric functions. We also have, at the moment, no connection to the interior of the black hole. And that would also tie in to the question about evaporation history. So we don't know how 
blocking radiation or the final state of the evaporation process will be. On the wish list is also how to include angular momentum in the construction, or if we can relate the geometry that we found to computations that work directly in terms of scattering amplitudes. However, prediction is that at least the last three items will be very difficult to address. Now we also talked a little bit about mass inflation. We found that regular black holes work quite differently from classical mass inflation for the Reisner Nordstrom case. And essentially, the Hawking radiation plays a crucial role. Now, there are two central questions that are raised by these findings. So, can we actually continue space time beyond the Cauchy horizon? And what is the role of cons cosmic censorship in this framework? So, giving a brief summary, going back to the title of my talk. So, if you consider black holes beyond general relativity, there is still a lot of things that need to be understood. And what I really like about this is that it is an interdisciplinary research area. So it ties to observations. It has a theory component and also close component to mathematical physics. So I think there's a lot of room to do innovative research in this direction. And with this, I'm at the end of the talk, and thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Let's uh, let's all thank, thank Frank for that wonderful talk. And uh, oh, I already see some questions. So uh, go ahead, uh, Steve. I I saw your hand first. Okay. Um... <clears throat> Sorry, uh, I am confused about these regular black holes at a very basic level that maybe you can help me with. Um, I understand how to construct one of these solutions by hand, but suppose for instance, that I have a shell of light that's falling in spherically symmetrically. How does the interior know that it's supposed to become the sitter before the shell reaches it? Um, how does how do you form one of these dynamically uh, when the information about the formation of the black hole doesn't get to the interior until the black hole has already formed? Mm -hmm. I think in terms of formations of these things, you need dynamical principles that modify gravity or some other aspect of the collapse. And I think the best candidate that is currently on the market is nonlinear electrodynamics. And I think in this case, you can get dynamical equations of motion that prevent the collapse into a singularity. Hmm. So in principle, you have to find a dynamics that actually violates the assumptions of Penrose singularity yeah. theorems. And I think non-local electrodynamics actually does the job. Okay. Uh, Ricardo? Yeah. Oh, thank you for the very nice talk. My question is, uh, I would say that's more curiosity, like in your graphs, when you show the, the behavior of the function, uh, the mass function, you show several types of black holes. And the, the ones before that there was the, the several graphs. Yes, exactly. And you give the explicit more details when the situation, when it grows to this constant. But I think that's much more curious, this graph on the right, when you see some kind of oscillation in the tail of the, like the, Asymptotic behavior dysfunction comparing to the line. Can you give me a little bit more uh, physical intuition what is going on in this oscillatory process 
Oh, you okay. should not try to interpret these oscillations. I think this is just weak numerical integration. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I was in, not sure if it was just a numerical problem or if it was really a physical situation going on. No, it's really a numerical artifact that uh -huh. these systems, in terms of getting the late time dynamics numerically, it's difficult. Okay. So that's. So if you want to integrate over two orders of magnitude at some point your numerical solver produces unphysical features okay. and in principle by going to infinite accuracy these things are gone okay. so the expected behavior is in fact that this the red curve it's the line approximates the yeah exactly approximates from from yes. the low yeah okay perfect thank you very much Are there any other questions? I don't see any. So, uh, well, since we're about at the ending time anyway, I don't. Uh, I we really thank uh, Frank again for the wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then. A good evening, and for me, it's bedtime now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, uh, this is the last talk of the day. So um, before we, or as we wrap up, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone on behalf of the organizers uh, for attending, for all the attendees for attending. Thank all of the speakers, today's speakers, and any you know, the other speakers in attendance. Uh, also, we had been in. Uh, correspondence with uh, Brandon Carter, and I saw that he joined as well. So thank you, Brandon, for being able to make it today. Um, and yes, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow and uh, uh, have a good evening. <laughs>